Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today, Monday's 4 p.m. COVID update. Uh, to give you a preview, things continue to move in the right direction and, and move in there quickly. Uh, last week, when we get to the week comparisons, was our lowest number of cases in 11 weeks. Uh, you know, we're down from 30,000 cases to about 9,700. But remember, that's up from about 1,200 cases uh, in the summer when we got to our, our best place in a while in battling COVID. We're under 1,000 Kentuckians hospitalized now. And we hope that continues to decrease. And we are now under 6% on our positivity rate. So let's start with the numbers from the weekend on Saturday. That's our highest number of cases for the three days we're reporting, 1,275. Also, unfortunately, 30 new deaths. Remember, deaths follow cases. And they included uh, four Hardin County deaths, um, three from October, one from September, one man who was 30 years old. Sunday, 803 new cases, 28 deaths. Uh, they included a number of younger Kentuckians, a 33-year-old man from Kenton County, a 48-year-old woman from Pike County, and a 43-year-old woman from Pulaski County. Remember, the Delta variant is not just uh, sickening younger people, it is killing them. So you need to get your vaccine. Monday, hard to remember uh, days that were this low, 544 new cases. Uh, we've had days uh, a lot lower than that, but it's been a little while. Uh, 23 new deaths, including a 49-year-old man from Bullock County. Our current positivity rate, 5.84%. Kentuckians currently hospitalized, 919. And remember, sometimes it ticks up a little on Tuesday because of reporting over the weekend, but, but then the trend, uh, you know, is always continued down. 281 Kentuckians currently in the ICU, 157 on a ventilator. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, those are all continuing positive trends, which means they are decreasing in this instance. Let's look at our stair-stepper chart. We are almost decreasing in cases at the speed that we increased. That is a very good sign. Um, obviously, we, we went through exponential growth in cases, and that's led to significant loss of life that we're still seeing on our reports. But the decrease is a very good sign. Once again, it's the lowest in 11 weeks. But still, if you look at where it is at that 9,749, you know, that's that looks good when you compare it to 30,680. But look at how much higher it still is than just about any week we had before that really tough period in the fall and in the winter of last year. And then the most recent uh, just devastating uh, uh, period that we are hopefully coming out of. Again, trending in the right direction. You now we've gotten down to just over a thousand cases uh, in the summer, which was a very good place to be. Um, that's that should be our our goal again, is to get to a a place where COVID is uh, uh, that there are many fewer cases. Positivity rate, which remember is a leading indicator. Cases a bit of a lagging indicator, though. Our 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 cases are. Uh, now reported uh, you know, closer in time than they were in the past. You can see also um, a <laughs> positively negative trend uh, that that it is very positive for us that the positivity rate is falling and it is falling uh, pretty quickly. Admittedly, it's fall falling more quickly than we anticipated. Uh, inpatient census for Kentucky hospitals. Remember, we want as as uh, strong of a downward slope as possible. That looks pretty good. We are now um, below and, and maybe even significantly below um, where we were at the height of the fall and the winter surge, uh, though we still have a ways to go to, to get where we were in our better times uh, during the course of this pandemic. But again, this is good. 
right? It's good. The, the decrease is real. It is continuing. Uh, we see that in the ICU as well, uh, where we are very fortunate it's decreasing. So this is decreasing a little uh, slower than the number of cases. We think that's because of how sick the Delta variant makes people. Um, but the, the trend is, is similar in cases in that it is decreasing. And then Kentuckians on a ventilator. Um, you know, it, it was until the alpha variant, we had some Kentuckians on a ventilator. And then, you know, we had that spike during the fall and the winter. Uh, but look at, at how much deadlier or, or how much sicker the Delta variant made people than the, than the alpha. Uh, also, how many people it infected, how quickly. But again, that continues to decrease at a very significant rate. Vaccination status of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. This is holding uh, pretty steady. Um, you know, again, 85% of all cases. And remember, you can test positive and not be sick. You can have COVID, you know, but not be ill or, or not have significant uh, effects from it. So 85% shows you can still get the Delta variant if you're vaccinated. You can still spread it. But then you go down, especially to hospitalizations. Again, about 92% of all hospitalizations are unvaccinated individuals. And then um, deaths, 82% of all deaths, unvaccinated individuals. But this is what brings us back to boosters. And I'll talk a little bit about kids and boosters. But if you are over 65, you need to have a booster. Now, you could have taken any of the shots and you need to get your booster. The Moderna booster is ready, available. Pfizer booster, ready, available if you're over 65. If you took J&J, &J, you need to talk to your doctor about whether you should take a different booster. In other words, Moderna or Pfizer, which they're now allowing, or go ahead and get the other J&J. &J. A lot of these deaths are from individuals over 65 or part two of boosters. If you have significant underlying conditions, you can now get any of the boosters. So again, if you're over 65, if you have a serious underlying condition, or if you're exposed to a whole lot of people through your work, now, no matter what booster you, well, no matter what vaccine you got, you can get a booster. I want to go over that one more time. Over 65, have an underlying condition or have a job that exposes you to a lot of people, go get your booster. Now, there's just one more piece to that. If you got J&J, &J, go get a booster. Doesn't matter how old if you got it. Doesn't matter what your job is. If you got J&J, &J, go get your booster. Uh, go get it now. I would act with some urgency in all this. Um, I would act with uh, as, you know more urgency if you got J&J &J and Pfizer because we believe there are more breakthroughs there. But if you got Moderna and you fall in any of those categories, go get your booster. We believe that will change these uh, death numbers, breakthroughs uh, to the better uh, with much better protection. Our hospital report, things are getting better. COVID hospitalizations have decreased 20% over the last seven days in our rolling average. 171 ICU beds available. Again, that's floated, but it, it hasn't gotten nearly um, um, where we were, where it was when we were most concerned. 53 hospitals continue to report critical staffing shortages. Uh, 11 children hospitalized with COVID, three in an ICU, two on a ventilator. We'd like to see that number reach zero. All right, COVID-19 vaccines for five to 11-year-olds. One of the most exciting topics to me, a dad of an 11 year old. I've been waiting on the news for the vaccine to be approved since COVID hit or since we knew there would be vaccines. Like so many other families, I am so eager for my daughter to be able to get her vaccine because I know they're safe. I know they're effective. I love my wife. I love my kids more than anything, more than this job. Would have never, ever recommended to them or, or gone with them. I went with my son to, to get um, his, his second shot. If I didn't believe, didn't know that they are safe, 
and they are effective. They are safe for you. They are safe for your children, and they can lead us to that better world. I hope just not back to normal. I hope we're a little better after what we've experienced. And looks like kids won't have to wait much longer. An advisory panel of the FDA is scheduled to meet tomorrow to consider Pfizer's application for children 5 to 11. Remember, this FDA advisory panel meets, eventually makes a recommendation, and then it goes back to the CDC, and then ultimately up to the director uh, of the CDC. We expect they will be authorized. In fact, they're already being shipped so that they're ready. Um, that It's normally the day after they're authorized. Remember, Dr. Stack walked through. These are not just less of the adult vaccine. Remember, it's only Pfizer for five to 11-year-olds that's looking at being authorized, and they have to package it differently. You cannot use an adult file to give um, a child five to 11 a vaccine. Uh, the kids are going to be, I believe, in the orange vials, whereas the parents are in the purple. Um, so when you take your children in, and we'll show that again on Thursday, it won't it won't be fully authorized by Thursday, but we'll show, uh, or if it is, that's, that's a great thing, but we will, we will get that out to make sure everybody sees what it looks like so you can be sure when you are taking your kid in. So I think it's only weeks away. I hope it's less than weeks away. Uh, it'd be really exciting if we could get many of our kids vaccinated, especially uh, before Christmas when I know people want to get together like they did in 2019. All right, today we're going to hear from Rebecca Dutch, PhD professor at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine, who will answer why it's so important for those eligible to receive a COVID vaccine booster. As we shared last week, in addition to Pfizer, Moderna and J&J &J boosters are now approved following the CDC's decision last Thursday. If you'd like to learn more about booster eligibility, we went over it, but you can also go to kycovid19.ky.gov. So what we're there seeing now is that over time, the your immune response to the vaccine that you got is slowly decreasing. Now, if you look, for instance, at the Pfizer vaccine, you're seeing a decrease in protection from getting COVID, but very little decrease in your protection from hospitalizations. You're still very, very protected against severe COVID and hospitalization. But you're more likely now than you would have been seven to eight months ago to get COVID itself. Um, and so to decrease those chances, what they're recommending is that certain groups of people go ahead and get a booster right now. What that will do is basically give your immune system another chance to see the, the thing they're going to respond to and up their response level. So it's a protective mechanism. Uh, next, uh, we're going to hear from a number of participants from St. Stephen's Church. This church is doing their part to fight the war on COVID-19 by hosting multiple vaccine clinics, but I believe uh, you're going to hear about one in Louisville. Today, we'll hear from my friend, Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby, senior pastor at the church, and Erica Geddes, a doctor of internal medicine at UofL Health, who are going to discuss the statistics on vaccine numbers and how important it is that we do our part to fight this virus. Vaccine recipients Gary and Tyrone Daniels will also share their stories with COVID and why they decided to get vaccinated. Uh, you need good health, and if we're really concerned about our people, then we're going to do what we can to help our people stay safe and healthy. And this vaccination is so important. And also because the church, especially for the black community, has always been the hub and center of activities in the black community. I had had double pneumonia uh, in October. I almost died from that. So I was going to make sure I was going to take this visor shot. The majority of the shots that I've seen given today actually have been more of the boosters, uh, the populations, a couple of first dose uh, vaccinations. So that's exciting to go ahead and start that trial to say, hey, you're, you're now on board to, to have your immunity there in that 90th percentile. I think it's important for people to be vaccinated so that we can 
get this pandemic that we're in uh, eradicated, at least get it down to where we can handle it. The Christian faith is a thinking person's faith. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. So we should use the cerebral gifts that God has endowed us with um, to find out what is the best health practices to keep us safe during this pandemic. And according to the science, uh, which I am confident, have confidence in, uh, the vaccination is the best thing to do. Speaking of vaccinations, over the weekend, 7,685 new vaccines. It does appear that we may be slowing a bit um, in pace, but you know, that is to be expected. Um, we're going to wait to go through the demographic breakthrough on Thursday when we hope to have uh, final and as accurate as we can um, numbers. So what we believe to be the case, and again, we'll, we'll be able to go over final numbers on Thursday, is that um, one of the major chains uh, was entering data in two different ways, resulting in duplications uh, that wasn't caught in the federal system. Uh, what we think that could mean is up to a couple hundred thousand first doses uh, being duplications in our numbers, um, potentially um, up to 5% of our overall numbers, maybe even close to 6% being duplications. Again, that's not something anybody uh, wants to see, and we'll get the, the final numbers on Thursday because we believe that there are uh, some individuals not included at the moment, too, but it's just important that we are accurate and we are transparent. Uh, we don't believe it'll change our positioning as opposed to our neighbors, but that's not what's important. What's important is how many of our people are vaccinated. This did not occur, we, we don't believe, while... Uh, Kentucky system was in place, but again, the information mainly just needs to be right, um, and we think we'll be able to make all of the adjustments based on final information we're getting from the federal government on Thursday. Uh, it appears that Kentucky is not the only state um, that will be making some of these adjustments, and it just means we've got to work harder. Um, if we can get a more accurate number, we know how many more people and where still need to get vaccinated, and we will go and do the work. I also want to remind Kentuckians today that FEMA is providing financial assistance for those families hit the very hardest by COVID. We've seen a whole lot of deaths these past couple of weeks, and you know, death is already hard enough, and the funeral expenses on top of it can be enough to, to hit the living, the families, uh, even harder. Uh, so I want to remind everybody that FEMA is willing to pay some of those costs for you if you have gone through this. Um, it's funeral expenses incurred after January 20th of 2020, so it ought to include all COVID deaths. It's part of the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021 and the American Rescue Plan Act. Expenses that qualify for reimbursement, transportation for up to two people to identify a deceased individual, transfer of remains, a casket or an urn, the burial plot or cremation niche, a marker or a headstone, a clergy or, or the other um, you know, officiant services, and the arrangement of a funeral ceremony, the use of funeral home equipment or staff, cremation or internment costs, costs associated with producing multiple death certificates. So just about everything, that goes on uh, around that that funeral of your loved one, you can apply to, to get reimbursed. And I know that might be hard, and it should be your decision if you've already gone through this, if you want to apply for those funds. But I want you to know that they're there. And if you're already struggling and, and you struggled more you know, to, to do right by your loved one, please take advantage of, of this program and, and let the federal government lessen some of the financial uh, burden that you faced. So to be eligible, uh, the death has to have occurred in the United States. The death certificate must indicate the death was attributed to or caused by COVID-19. That's just one of the causes that are lifted, listed. And the applicant must be a U.S. citizen. The applicant has to be a U.S. citizen, but that doesn't mean the deceased has to be a U.S. citizen. 
So in other words, if you're a U.S. citizen with a foreign born parent, say, uh, who who didn't become a U.S. citizen and passed away here in the States due to COVID, uh, you can apply. We lost more than 9,000 Kentuckians. Uh, and so far, the families of about uh, 4,300 have registered for this assistance. So a lot of people are going through the process. Of those, 2,500 have received assistance for a total of more than $18 million. If the applicant has all the required documentation, it only takes about 20 days to, to get the funding. So everybody's lost somebody. I know that's hard, um, but it's there. And, and I will say, we have some incredibly strong people out there. At SOAR, I talked to uh, um, a lady that, that I've known uh, a little bit for a while who had lost um, her husband to COVID. Uh, and painful uh, for her to talk about, but this was somebody that had to go through this whole process and hopefully has, has, has considered uh, making this application. And you can always lean on friends and other, other members of your family to, to help you do it. I uh, know everybody out there wants to help. It's why they let their homes up green. It's why they did so many things during this. So if you need to, to get through filling out something like that, you know, lean on other people. They want to help. All right, it's another uh, update on things getting better. Um, remember when we were getting overwhelmed, we requested five FEMA EMS strike teams to help transfer and transport COVID-19 patients. Each team consisted of five ambulances, and they were assigned across the state. The teams made a noticeable impact since their arrival, easing the strain on Kentucky's hospitals. Today, we thank FEMA and those who worked on these teams because yesterday was their last day of service. Uh, they are now headed to other places that need them more at the moment. Uh, we appreciate them. They ended up helping with 2,191 transport requests. They actually transported 1,957 actual patients. They drove more than 70,915 miles with patients on board, and they represented crews from 14 different states. Uh, these are people from outside Kentucky pitching in to help us in our hour of need. Thank you to FEMA. Thank you to those individuals who uh, left their families to come help ours for that period of time. Um, and finally, just uh, 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 two other quick things. Uh, one, uh, August 2021, uh, need statistic outside of COVID, we had the fifth highest hiring rate in the country. Uh, that meant that um, people are finding jobs, though I know we need them to find them faster. That 5.5 percent is 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 exciting. There's a lot going on in our labor market. Uh, we are laser focused on it and on uh, different things that we can do differently moving into the future. Workforce development is going to have to change and evolve and how we go about it. Uh, with the boomers retiring, with our level of disability, with challenges in childcare, you know, this is a time where we have to think differently and do more. But this is a really good sign. Um, and, and what we're seeing, whether it's through our announcements, whether it's through creation of new jobs, is employers uh, appear to see Kentucky as a place where they are more likely to get the workforce hired that they need. I think that's one of the reasons that they are betting on us. Uh, last, I was asked for an update the last time on my request to legislative leaders for um, uh, members to join a working group to talk about hero pay. Uh, my plan to provide $400 million to uh, healthcare heroes and, and everybody else, those in manufacturing that worked all the way through our police, our firefighters, our grocery store workers, and so many others. Um, uh, the, the Democratic caucus in the House and the Senate sent us names on Friday. Um, the Republican majority of each said, no, thank you. Um, you know, it's uh, certainly something I wish that they would have been willing to do. You know, if you rewind, when um, these same individuals were saying I did not consult them enough during COVID, my response was, we went through the normal process. We testified more than 70 times at committees. And the response was, no, we're looking for a different type of consultation. Well, here we openly said, let's form a group. Let's consult. Let's make those decisions together. And the letter we got said, you can go through our committee process. 
So it may say something about um, who, who, what type of politics was been playing uh, then or now, but we are still going to move forward. Uh, I believe strongly that our people who've worked almost two years through this pandemic deserve appreciation, deserve encouragement, deserve an attaboy and an atta girl. And this can be an incentive for people to uh, hold on. So we're going to move forward in working with um, the parts of the legislature that are willing to work with us on trying to define uh, the categories for it, the amounts for it. We look forward to hearing from uh, the different groups. Um, and, and as part of that, we want you to be able to tell your story about the amazing work that you did during the pandemic. You know, all too often we talk about the same groups, and it's understandable if we're talking about healthcare groups, it's because they're helping really sick people. But you may have been working in a manufacturing facility that stopped doing the thing that makes your company money and started making masks or other forms of PPE. And that's really incredible. It could have been at the tough moments where you were the only person on the road going to a grocery store. So when that person came in, you know, there was food on the, on the shelves. You could be that truck driver uh, that was taking absolutely necessary supplies uh, across the country at a uh, dangerous time when we didn't know who could get infected and, and when. You could be one of the utility workers that made sure that power was, was getting to our, our homes. You could be one of our social workers that was still going out on calls because you knew children were in danger. Uh, we want to make sure that as this pandemic hopefully is coming to a close, uh, that we reward you as one Kentucky for the amazing things that you have done and for the courage you've had and that you get a chance to tell the rest of Kentucky uh, your story. Uh, I look forward to listening and to trying to hear um, and to celebrating uh, that work. All right, we'll move to questions. We have three journalists here with us, about five on the phone. Uh, we'll start with Chad Hedrick from WKYT. Governor, going back to the job numbers that you just showed, the recent report from the U.S. Bureau of Labor shows Kentucky has the highest rate of people quitting their jobs, and in turn also shows that there are, we have the second highest rate for job openings. So we've got these numbers that you were just yep. showing, and then kind of a, a, a downward slope. Can you just talk about yeah, so, Kentucky as a whole? So so our challenges in the in the labor market are complex. Uh, some folks remember just wanted to say it was about unemployment and, and the unemployment pay. You can't get unemployment if you quit. So when you're thinking about quits, there's something more complicated there uh, that's that's going on. It may be that um, people are looking for a different environment. It may be other jobs uh, have have opened up. It's going to require that the private sector get a little creative um, and also in many instances try to um, improve conditions, uh, maybe even pay. But I can break it down. So we had uh, a hiring rate of 5.5%, which was the fifth highest in the nation. The quit rate was a full point below that at 4.5%. Remember, we're talking about the same overall numbers that these are a percentage of. So the number of hires in the Commonwealth um, outpaced uh, quits by 19,000. And at 5.5%, our hiring rate is 1.2 percentage points higher than the rest of the U.S. So we've got some good things going on. We also have some things that are um, very similar to what's going on in the rest of the country. Um, now, it does make sense that if we have more jobs opening up, there will be some people who who, who ultimately move jobs. And you can only move a job by, by quitting um, or getting fired. Um, but in this instance, uh, the, the voluntary move. So, so again, we're, we're going through a major period of transition and, and, and none of it is, is simple. Um, but there's some really good things uh, going on right now. And, and uh, I think people ought to feel more hope than concern. Um, but knowing that, you know, even even in a time of, of excitement, there are challenges out there. Now, with all the job openings and the rest, it's also a wonderful time to move to Kentucky, to have more opportunities here. And, and we're really starting to see that. Uh, when was the last time our, uh, our hiring um, in a month was 1.2 percent over the rest of the country? So pretty neat to see Kentucky in the in the highlighted area in, in that. Uh, Tom Latek. Two and, and they're kind of clarifications on what you've already uh, mm -hmm. spoken about. One of them is on the the FEMA funeral money. Yes. 
is L, is there an income limit or anything like that for people to apply? Or can anyone uh, apply for those benefits? And is there a ceiling? So there is a, a ceiling. I don't have it in my notes about the amount uh, that you can secure. I know that is in there. And let us get you the information on whether there is an income level. I don't remember that from the original um, report that, that came out. Okay. And my second question, if you would, uh, on the vaccine numbers that you said the state mm -hmm. has that are wrong, are you going to just toss the state numbers and then go totally with the, with the federal so, numbers? So we're already, back, we're already totally with the federal numbers. This has occurred since we moved to the, to the federal numbers. So this is about how reporting has come into the federal database um, and then the, the federal database correcting uh, itself. I mean, this is, this is a massive undertaking. This, we want it to be right all the time, but it's a massive undertaking with every state tracking hundreds of millions of, of vaccines. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think we will be able to get, I think we will be able to get it down to somewhere between 10 and, and 20,000 total vaccinations on, on accuracy and be able to go through um, how we believe it happened. But you know, the numbers aren't firm even as of today. Um, but we'll give you the best we've got by by Thursday. Uh, Mike Valenti. Uh, question on the, the work that's underway to enhance security between Capitol and Annex. Mm -hmm. How do you believe this will uh, improve safety? And I'm curious, did the, the insurrection on January 6th serve as a catalyst in any way? To this so, so after 9-11, if we can go all the way back, um, the uh, 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 federal agencies, FBI, I believe Secret Service too, made two major recommendations for our Capitol grounds. Number one, to put a fence around the governor's mansion. And number two, to close the, the just a section of road, the loop that is between the Capitol and the annex. And what have we seen since, um, even recently? We have seen people drive their cars through demonstrators which we have lots of demonstrations, I would know, uh, behind the, uh, the, the, the Capitol. And so when you talk about protecting people's First Amendment rights, we think this does it. We think it protects their safety during that. Um, we've seen a, a car bomb as close as Nashville, right, going off and, and impacting um, the grid. Um, the ability, if that's not blocked off, for someone to even drive their car up into the Capitol or into the annex before people can react um, wouldn't be very challenging for someone to, to do. Um, we saw with um, people going past all the barriers at the governor's mansion early in COVID. Um, one of the rationales for those recommendations uh, right there, and, and certainly um, the January 6th insurrection, uh, how it's come to light, how many different anti-government groups there are out there, the level of domestic terrorism, all come together. But it, it, it comes down to this for me. Um, I'm not going to be the governor who failed to act and people got hurt. I'm not going to be the governor that fails to, to put up the, the bollards and, and close that section of road, even if, even if it could, creates an inconvenience and that ultimately costs people their, their lives. I can't go back in time with other people's decision to do or not to do something. I can just look at, at my responsibility and I think we're serving it. Now, um, we only heard from a few legislators, um, most uh, and certainly the, the security, um, I think all got it. Uh, and I, I think in time, because immediate change gets, gets everybody, in time, the concept of having a, an entire green space uh, for um, any type of, not, not, it doesn't have to be a demonstration. It could be a festival here in Frankfurt. It could be so many uh, different things. It's going to be uh, really exciting. It's going to give a more campus feel, I think, between the, the annex and the Capitol. And who knows, maybe a, a campus feel will uh, improve relations at, at different times. We can all talk outside where it's sunny. Maybe it'll bring out our better, our better nature. Sarah Ladd, The Courier Journal. Yes, thank you. Um, could we get an update on the memorial that's planned for going up there at the Capitol to recognize those who um, died from COVID, please? Thank you. Yes, um, we. Uh, it's now down to, I think, five proposals uh, that have been sent to the committee 
um, that we put together. Those were people that asked to be a part uh, of it, that, that sent in their names and their story. Uh, they have a kind of a series of questions uh, to look at each one and, and give their um, genuine, authentic uh, response to. Um, we will then take those and, and ultimately be able to make a final uh, selection. The artists that submitted um, have been advised if they're in those last five or, or not. Uh, we've had uh, major hospital systems primarily step up and, and agree to help fund uh, it, we believe we now have the, the private sector funding necessary to, to move forward with it. Um, I've seen the the five. Am I right, Scotty? It's five. Um, the five and all of them um, would be special. Um, but I really want to hear from those that have been impacted even more so than than I have um, by COVID. You know, how, how does it make them feel? about their work, say, as a as a uh, an ER doc on, on the front lines? How does it make them feel as a person who 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 lost somebody? Uh, we want to make sure we we take and we process all of that uh, to ultimately come up with the decision that is the most meaningful to uh, the majority of people. Uh, the location is also already set, though it can be moved just a little bit. We actually have a monument park here on the Capitol grounds. Um, you can only see one of those from the road. That is a gold star memorial. So as you come up to the Capitol and go to the right, it's on that side. This one will be closer to the parking lot. Um, so on the, on the, almost the end, if you're, if you're starting at the front of the Capitol on Monument Park. Uh, Karen Zar, WUKY. Okay, we'll come back to Karen. There you are. Uh, apologies, I'm having trouble with my feet on my end. If this has already been asked, uh, you can go ahead and move on and I can back up the, the feed. But it, do you have an indication as to how successful and how receptive Kentuckians are being to the boosters? And do you know if we are losing any supplies because of shelf life with the fives or in particular? Thank you so much. So we we certainly um, lose supplies, not necessarily because of shelf life, but the federal government gave us the go ahead that if you've got two people that are ready to get vaccinated, go ahead and vaccinate them, even if that means you break the seal and certain vaccines go unused. Uh, we believe that is the, the primary um, cause of, of certain doses. Uh, that are unused. I don't want to say they're wasted because I don't believe that's the case. It's different now than when we had people lined up out the door where you could make sure every single dose was used. Now it's so important with the Delta variant uh, to get that that vaccine in people's arms. Uh, we haven't I haven't seen the statistics on the third dose yet on the booster. That's something that we can work on on getting but i think you, you when you back it up you'll see in the saint stephen video they were talking about the majority of people that came to their clinic uh, being booster doses and uh, booster recipients anecdotally um hearing a whole lot of people getting their their boosters i do think it's people over 65 that we're having the best success with and they're also the most vaccinated group I think some of the professions and maybe some of the underlying conditions, though anecdotally, we think that that those folks are, are going in. They know uh, they need it. But certainly forward-facing professions, I think, will have more uh, to do. Uh, Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News. Um, hi, Governor. Uh, so Kentucky has a higher rate of cases than the national average, but appears to be um, have a better rate around deaths, just below the national average. I was just curious if you, uh, if there's a reason for that, or if you thought, if you can kind of expand mm -hmm. on the reason for that, possibly. Well, I think I think there are a number of of reasons. Um, I think that while we have had a lot of cases, that Kentuckians have have worked hard to protect uh, one another. Uh, that those who have family members that have pre-existing conditions that would make them more susceptible to this virus. And remember, our population has more of those pre-existing conditions than just about anywhere else. 
have worked very hard to protect their loved one and, and those that are suffering from those conditions. I think have worked very hard to stay safe. But I think a significant uh, driver is our healthcare system and decisions that were made before. Uh, if you look at states to our south where the death rate is higher, they did not expand Medicaid, which means fewer people in their state have general access to health care, see a doctor regularly. I believe the expansion of health care and all the steps that we've done to provide access are absolutely critical in where we are right now. So I believe things that we did, just believing that health care was a basic human right, and in many instances, some things my dad did, uh, along with how our people have responded, and I think how our governments, that's us and state government and local governments have responded. Then the last thing I'd, I'd say is, I mean, our, our healthcare folks have worked so hard uh, and their results have been so good um, compared to, uh, to most. Um, we've seen throughout this that access to healthcare is now the difference between life and death. Uh, and I believe everything in the past that we did to expand healthcare uh, has 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 saved has saved countless uh, numbers of lives. Uh, Corinne Boyer, WEKU. Hi, Governor. In July, you said that hospitals had learned from the winter surge and were prepared for another. And then the Delta variant hit, and hospitals became quickly overwhelmed. Now that we're moving into winter, what are hospitals expecting? And what is being done differently to prepare for a possible winter surge? Thank you. Yeah, to, to be fair, we're, we're still, we're still uh, trying to get people well, as hospitals still have uh, too many people. Um, but, but I believe that that preparation period is about to begin. Um, I think we got to be humble. None of us know what we're going to see in the winter. And this thing hadn't acted the same season to, to season. Now, the Delta variant at least in my opinion, acted different than the alpha variant. And everybody wants to say it likes this type of weather or that type of weather. Certainly it likes people in close confined spaces and, and that's uh, certainly more possible in the winter that we'll have more people vaccinated and even boosted uh, in the winter. Uh, certainly I was, I was asked by some, some governors that got hit a little bit later uh, than we did that if you could go back in time, what would you, what would you do before the Delta variant? Um, and we would have worked with our regional hospitals and they did a phenomenal job. Um, but on, on being able to increase the level of care, go ahead and convert uh, spaces uh, to ICU spaces or expand them, uh, go ahead and get some additional equipment on site um, for, for our stockpile, uh, go ahead and purchase some things that we didn't previously have runs on you know, very basic uh, hospital equipment that would be needed in, in just about uh, any state. Um, in, in moving forward, making sure that we've got the ability to provide monoclonal antibodies, whatever next variant they should um, be, be more effective than a lot of treatments that, that we've gotten. Uh, and, and to the extent we're gonna have another big surge, um, consistently message from the start, not to go to the hospital to get tested, set up testing locations. We really have them advertised testing locations locally, especially um, in, in a uh, different way. Um, and the guard will be ready to help again. They are uh, now trained for this and, and provided uh, critical relief. I think we learned through what the guard could do well at hospitals, how we can free people up. The nursing students provided so much additional care and having that ready to go, uh, we were one of the first states to do it on the level that we did. And to think that started with a conversation at a picnic, uh, appreciating uh, our nurses. So, so it, 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 to, to distill it uh, all down, because uh, we're good at distilling here in Kentucky, um, taking every lesson we've learned. You know, we've never been through something like the Delta variant and, and never. And I think it taught us where those extra reserves are that we can pull from. Now, I think we also have to address our, our nursing shortage that we had before this, and, and that could be done in a number of ways. We've got to raise the caps that the Board of Nursing puts on our schools. We can train a lot more nurses, and there are a lot of openings that are out there. They're good paying jobs. They're all over 
We could create 1,300 plus jobs in Eastern Kentucky right now by just graduating um, uh, more nurses. I think we've got to uh, make it easier for nurses and doctors, so we do a little bit better on doctors from other states to be able to move here and begin practicing without a lot of hurdles. And I think we need to be more open to foreign born nurses like we are to foreign born doctors in, in different parts of our state. So I think those are all things that, that we can do and do a little more. I know that was a long answer, but with everything we've, we've lived through, we certainly learned a lot um, about how to increase capacity. But the other thing that we will do is we'll, we'll get, and, and we do this regularly with the calls, all of our hospital systems and others together um, to talk about lessons learned and, and to make sure that we have uh, the steps uh, ready, ready to go uh, and ready to go more quickly or, or maybe to be just a little more nimble. I think we, we now know in an exponential growth how quickly it can, it can happen. All right, John Cheese, Herald Leader. Uh, Governor, thank you. Um, on the boosters, in August, the CDC director and other top health officials outlined a plan for all adult Americans to get a booster shot because we were told the vaccines were losing some of their effectiveness over time, over six to eight months. And now we're told that only some groups uh, should get the booster, those over 65 and uh, et cetera, uh, should get the booster. Uh, other Americans are being told to, to hold off for now. Do we know what's changed in the last two months? And is there any plan, as far as you know, at some point for all Americans as originally planned to get the booster? So thank you. I absolutely believe that at some point, all Americans will be authorized to, to get a booster. I think that we are going there. Uh, and, and I think that uh, boosters are already complicated and there are multiple vaccines that are out there. And so the communication on it has been confusing and and complex and and difficult and and again i we're in the midst of a pandemic making wartime decisions trying to make the best communications we 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 can um so that's not placing blame it's just a third dose of a vaccine in this instance is more complicated i think what it came down to is different groups balancing the, the what what is what's out there in in different ways um i believe the the president and his group said we got plenty of vaccine in the us eventually everybody's going to need a booster the pfizer numbers show that it wanes over time and wanes for everybody let's get everybody boosted up and 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 better protected and i i get that i can't wait until that's the case and then you saw the fda and the cdc said wait a minute to get to herd immunity we need more people to get their first and their second shots and to truly defeat this thing, we need to vaccinate people all around the world. And if you have, even if it's waned, if you have 70% or 60% or protection instead of 90, there are folks out there that worldwide at least can't get the vaccine that have 0%. So those are, you know, those, those are all good people just balancing the challenges out there in, in different ways. I certainly, I mean, my, my job, is to protect the people of Kentucky. Uh, I want it as quickly as we can to be where everybody can get a booster. And if we need another booster in the future, to be able to get that too. Uh, my goal is everybody in Kentucky who is willing to get vaccinated, that we can keep their protection up at the highest level that they, they possibly can. Uh, you know, it, I, I think that it, um, the fact that the, the, the president came out early, uh, talking about one thing, and then the this FDA and the CDC approved another. You could, you you could say that was a mistake in some way, or you could say that that's the system actually working through, and that in this instance, the president in pressuring or forcing the scientific analysis and an ultimate uh, conclusion. But then the other side of that is there's public policy considerations in it too. So um, not easy decisions. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, not ones that I get to make. Um, our goal is just to have it ready. And five to 11 year olds is coming and it's coming soon uh, for those first two doses. All right, that's our report today. Again, things are getting much better, but the level is still higher um, and too high. But the good news is it's coming down fairly fast. So everybody who's willing, hang in there. We don't see a whole lot of people wearing masks right now it might not even be that much longer in certain places, 
but hang in there. Still a deadly variant out there, still not enough people vaccinated, but um, certainly the trends we are seeing are, uh, are positively negative, which is a real good thing in this pandemic. Thank you all.